Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the second part of, this, of today's event, which is entitled Behavioral Finance and Economic Policymaking. My name is Gillian Tett. I'm the US Managing Editor of the Financial Times, and I'm absolutely delighted to be presiding over this panel, um, not just because Professor Schiller kindly just gave out a bunch of um, commercials for my book, my Les book, <laughs> which I was watching from the green room, so I didn't need to blush, but thank you anyway. Um, but I'm also delighted because I believe this is a crucial topic of the age. As some of you may know, I have a PhD in cultural anthropology, not in macroeconomics <laughs> or quantitative physics or anything like that. And until 2007, I used to be very embarrassed um, whenever I spoke to people about my background, because there was a presumption that if you worked in economics, if you wrote about economics, you really needed to have a PhD in economics or astrophysics to justify doing that. Having a PhD in cultural anthropology was, as one bank CEO told me in 2007, all rather hippie. <laughs> <laughs> that was before, <laughs> before it was fashionable to be a hippie. Um, but I must say, since 2008, I've come out. I, t I tell people I had this weird background, because if there's one thing we've learned from the crisis in 2007, it's that there is a reason why the roots of the word credit come from the Latin credere, which means to believe, which is that finance is fundamentally a social construct. We learned that in the credit bubble, when markets did not behave as people like Alan Greenspan expected. We learned that after the credit bubble, when there was a huge, great crash and panic took, took hold, I would say we're learning that again now. Um, in fact, I just come back from Japan, where people are trying to puzzle about why the Japanese economy will not recover, why it's in such a funk, why monetary policy does not work. And I'd argue a lot of that's to do with psychology. So we have a fantastic panel of people to talk about these themes today. Um, we're going to be talking particularly about the practical implications of what Professor Schiller was talking about before. Namely, if you think that economics is about more than just numbers, what do you actually do about that? How do you respond if you are a bank or an economist or a trader? How do you respond if you're trying to run a country, run a central banking policy, etc.? What do you actually do in practice? So. The panel needs almost no introduction, but very briefly, on my far left, your right, is Ernesto Zadillo, the president, former president of Mexico, now director of the Center for the Study of Globalization. Next to him is Paul Volcker, the former chairman of the Federal Reserve and chairman of the Volcker Alliance. And on my immediate left, your right, is Willem Buter, chief, um, global chief economist of Citigroup and a renowned academic economist. So I would like to start with the economist, Professor Buter, and ask you, <laughs> you presumably spent the first part of your career crunching numbers, am I correct? Uh, actually, I didn't do numbers, I just did math. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, numbers, data, I mean, that, that's vulgar. Okay, <laughs> well, okay. models, were you, a, were you a model addict? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still a model addict? Well, it depends on the model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're so talking about the sort that you can have calculators, use with calculators. Tell us, how have you seen economics change or not change over the last decade, say? Well, I wrote a, a, a thought as a blog in 2008, I think it was, which was called uh, titled the, On the Almost Total Uselessness of uh, Conventional Macroeconomics. And uh, that was because by that time I had been an advisor to Goldman Sachs, in addition to a professor at uh, the LSE for, since 2005, and I watched the, uh, the economy coming apart, financial markets going berserk, and um, I, I, I um, recognized that nothing I had learned, right, except possibly um, the, you know, the, the, <laughs> sort of the accounting I learned from James Tobin was any good uh, and any use in understanding uh, what drove this crisis and very little good in what to do about it, how to manage it. Now, I think uh, economics will forever 
be lousy at, you know, at predicting, anticipating crises. We are like doctors, right? We don't prevent diseases. That's uh, social medicine for that. But uh, you know, we can sort of do something about it once somebody comes in with a, bleed, with a bleeding nose. So, uh, but, um, uh, so what, what we learned, whether it was new Keynesian or, uh, you know, or new classical, uh, it was completely useless. Uh, then there was um, a, s a collection I discovered of stories, uh, which is the behavioral economics, sort of anecdotes. Uh, no coherent theory, a cohesion framework, but it shed light on little, bits, little corners. I first got interested into it, actually, thanks to uh, my wife, uh, who, uh, well, starting as an even purer theorist than I ever was, uh, ended up uh, writing a number of papers on uh, uh, small group decision making, including central banks, which uh, relied heavily on uh, psychological and sociological uh, literature. Uh, we got both pushed into that, because that's the only thing that's unique about me, actually. I'm well, no, two things. First, I'm the only person who worked for Central Bank whose father robbed the Central Bank. Right? Um, that's, uh, that's definitely new. But the, the other second thing, I'll, I will explain that later. But, um, um, but, that's uh, called narrative suspense. Uh, but um, the, the second thing is, I, I, both I and my wife I have served on the monetary policy committees of nations where we weren't citizens. I did it in, uh, in, in, the, in the UK, and my wife in Iceland. And, um, the small group decision making you know, taught, uh, taught me so much about what, what's wrong with economics. You put you know, 10 people in a room, if there, say 10 extremists in a room, uh, the opinion that comes out is more extreme than the most extreme opinion of any of the uh, people in the room. This, uh, and similarly, you know, lefty or righty doesn't make any difference. So there's, there's these strange cognitive interactions that take place. Um, me uh, confirmation bias, right? Uh, just that it takes a lot more you know, to change your forecast than to stick to it, right? It makes no sense at all, but uh, somehow we will do it. Um, the going native bias, which I discovered later, uh, that country economists invariably are more optimistic about their country than anybody else, and they're always wrong. Um, <laughs> right? um, so these were all. Uh, extremely important, uh, I think, um, the importance in the central bank of preventing groupthink, right? That means bring in regularly outsiders. Uh, don't have people serve on uh, a central bank committee, even the governor, for more than eight years, right? And uh, bring in outsiders who have never before touched the inside of a, a central bank and are booted out after four years or so, uh, simply to bring in new thoughts, because groupthink is the end of common sense. Uh, but none of that, I, I, uh, economics didn't help me with that. Um, the main thing I learned about economics uh, is that you know, each country is open and the world is closed. This very important insight. That's basically application of Tobin, uh, you know, uh, flow of fund theory and, and balance sheets. So um, uh, the, the key thing about finance I had to learn in order to understand where the crisis came from is embroidering a bit of what you said, that finance really is trade in promises. Right? And uh, that creates an immediate problem, because it scales far too easily. Right? If Boeing wants to double its, product, its capacity, it takes him years to build the plant uh, you know, and um, hire the troops and you know, get the assembly line going. If there is optimism, trust, confidence, faith, right, <laughs> credibility, uh, then uh, the balance sheets, financial balance sheets, can scale up you know, by orders of magnitude in the space of days or weeks. That's the up. Down goes even faster. Right? And the combination of this super fast scaling up and scaling down, when there is scaling down, when there is lack of trust, lack of confidence, and... Um, and pessimism, right? And they can change spontaneously uh, uh, and in un unpredictable ways. Mm -hmm. It scales, uh, um, well, and the, the big asymmetry in uh, economic, which I again learned very little about in conventional finance, bankruptcy, default, right? You can't be super solvent, but you can be insolvent. There's a big nonlinearity there because of the private, personal, and social cost of 
of insolvency uh, uh, resolution. So this is, uh, uh, this is what I learned. So regulation was necessary, and then I learned you can't have good regulators because they invariably get captured. Right? And uh, there again, turnover helps. Right? Nobody should be a regulator for more than eight years. Uh, and they should definitely be banned from working in the industry that is regulated for life. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, th these are th th the problems that we are facing, and the problems the banks are facing in moment, have very little to do with anything in the world. Right. Too big to fail, uh, the only one solution, right? End it, and then uh, don't try to regulate in detail. Just force everybody to hold 40% capital against their assets, and so you break it, you own it. Right. Have you told your CEO that? No. <laughs> <laughs> this is my perfect. Yes. Oh, yeah, I've told him that. Yes, yeah. my personal view, of course. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> right, this is not city group policy. Um, well, I'd love to come back in a moment and ask you about what you think could be done on bank trading floors or in bank um, regulatory um, um, areas to actually deal with these problems of, of financial markets being driven by you know, emotion and things. But before I do, I'd like to ask um, President Zedillo, when you were in office, did you listen to economists? <laughs> well, I happened to be. <laughs> as he to yeah, I, I would stand in front of the mirror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. And did you believe what you heard? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I think I have to make a step back. You know, I think I went to school not with the idea that whatever I would be taught will be immediately <coughs> applicable to real life. The school I went, and we went to the same school, and we had the same professors. He was two years ahead of me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think basically we were told, you come here to learn how to think. Yeah. You come here you know, to acquire some tools, to be analytic, how to pose a problem, and so on and so forth. And I was very lucky that, uh, of course, I had Tobin, but I also got uh, good professors of economic history and so on. So when I was in office, and I started uh, being in office in the middle of a terrible crisis in Mexico, which uh, eventually we managed to overcome, and I remember that people would ask me two or three, four years later, OK, when you were in those very dark days, of early 95. Uh, what book did you look for? Well, I, I, I didn't look for my basic uh, macroeconomics, open economy, macroeconomics, or whatever. Uh, the book I looked for was a book I had read a few years earlier by Professor Kinderberger, mm -hmm. Manias, Panics, and Crashes. Uh, I looked because at the Bible. At, yeah. uh, because at some point, uh, very early, I sensed that the game was uh, quite different from what I had learned in the conventional uh, macroeconomic, uh, open economy macroeconomics. Uh, and I think that was terribly useful because I realized very early on that we were going through a process of panic. Uh, and in that book, uh, Professor Kindleberger described very well this Minsky <laughs> <laughs> process, you know, moment. and it was extremely useful. So anyways, I used that. And then I remember on September 15, 2008, uh, at 4 in the morning, I mean, I was, I was not following the radio or anything like that, but in the morning I found out what had happened with Lehman Brothers. At 1 in the afternoon, I had uh, to teach my class <laughs> at the university at Yale. And uh, we were due to see financial globalization later in the semester. <laughs> and I said to my students, stop the clock. We are going to move uh, forward that topic. Uh, and the first thing that you need to do is to read uh, the chapters that I have assigned to you of Professor Kindersberger's uh, book. And uh, of course, I had some students who had been students of Professor Schiller and really were very <laughs> advanced relative to the other students <laughs> in understanding. <laughs> Actually, I had a student who was, who, who was a student of Schiller, but also had to spend the summer work, working with Paulson, not at the Treasury, the other Paulson, <laughs> you know? So I had these uh, incredible students. So early in October, we had a meeting here, and I remember there was this uh, nice discussion with David Rubinstein and uh, Alan Blinder, and they were asked what was going on. 
you know. And that night, I wrote to my students, and I said to them, you know, you may never get to be as rich as David Rubinstein and as famous as an economist as, as Blinder, but I think at this point, you understand better what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> I made you <laughs> read uh, your Kinderberger and your Schiller, and you have also taken uh, macroeconomics. So I would say this eclectic uh, attitude, I mean, uh, no, uh, nobody should go to, to, to a school uh, and say, okay, now I have my models and all this, and now I work uh, at the central bank or the Ministry of Finance. That will be absolutely uh, stupid. At the end of the day, you have to make uh, decisions, you have to have solid foundations, but you have to, you know, have common, common sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, uh, and that's, a lot of psychology, right? Too, right? And character. Right. So you don't train people just with models. Right. Chairman Volker, I'm, well, always well, well, I'm always well. fascinated by the Federal Reserve because, you know, of course, the Fed has built one of the most powerful economic models that are out there. And that's been driving a lot of what the Fed's done in recent years. Never mind the fact it seems to ignore finance and ignore the rest of the world both of which are quite important right now. Um, so from your own experience with the Federal Reserve, how do you look at economics now? Well, I, you know, a lot of questions get involved. We'll get to the Federal Reserve, but uh, I want the audience to understand that I have a comparative advantage. You have cultural anthropology. But I took economics. Uh, it was the last year in the graduate school in Harvard. You could take economics without taking Mathematics. <laughs> if you didn't take mathematics, you had to take French. I'm not very good at French either, but, it, it's good <laughs> but I always considered that something of an advantage as time passed that I did not get terribly absorbed in the uh, mathematical uh, preoccupations of economists. And uh, I spent all this time at the blackboard and thinking that it reflected. Reality, but I can remember when I was it's a precursor of the Federal Reserve, but as a college, I took all these economics courses, and most of them seemed rather fuzzy to me. Labor economics. I mean, we learned about the Labor Relations Act and a lot of institutional stuff, or public finance and a lot of institutional stuff. Then you learn money and banking. Uh, ah, here you get some certainty. You got a balance sheet. You got assets. You got liabilities, it's just subtract the liabilities from the asset. You know what the capital is, and we know what capital is, and loans, and whatever. Now, I, my lifetime has been a long excursion into learning that balance sheets are not always what they appear to be <laughs> on the surface. Uh, but it took me a while to, to learn all that. Uh, but when I... Uh, I started the Federal Reserve, I had the advantage of, I, mean, I started, I'm talking about now, 1950, a while ago. But I ended up at the trading desk for a while. And it's not a trading desk in that we weren't buying or selling to make money, but we were buying or selling to expand the money supply or whatever. But we observed the markets. And I remember thinking of economics, you know, when supply and demand changes, prices change. People come in and buy and sell and all that stuff. And you, you got a supply curve and you got a demand curve. My simple observation in the market is mostly when it changed, nothing happened except psychology. Something had happened maybe in the newspaper, but very little there. Sometimes it was hard to identify nothing. what happened. Uh, one little anecdote, uh, as fresh as this morning. I was in, involved in a, uh, a large fund and discussing the investment of the money and so forth. And I was kind of observing, but the uh, investment managers were explaining in a very complicated way what, what areas of the market seemed better or worse or indifferent. And they presented some charts that showed stock market. <coughs> And they showed mean, the stock market, over a period of years in terms of price earnings ratios and some other measures. And they drew a nice, fairly smooth line. And they said, well, you know, it's very interesting to see how far we are from the mean. And uh, maybe that gives us some indication as to where the market's going to go. And then he finally said, yes, 
But you know, I have to tell you the characteristic of all these markets is the price is never at the mean. It's always moving through the mean. <laughs> and that's what the charts show, big ups and downs. And you can calculate the average, but the average is fairly meaningless in terms of trying to predict uh, the market or whatever. Uh, and I, I think the central banks, to some extent, I got caught up in this business of um, they could develop some theories and some mathematical models. And when I, when I became chairman of the Federal Reserve, I think the general consensus was the Federal Reserve had the best developed econometric model of the economy. And they presented this, of course, to the Open Market Committee every month or six weeks, however often we met. And money was getting pretty tight and interest rates were very high. And what their model showed was we either were in a recession or we're going to be next month. It was not a great atmosphere for tightening money even further. But we went ahead and did it anyway. And for six months, the projection was every month that we were going to be in a recession the next month. And it came right against interest rates going to 20% or close to 20%, very tight market conditions. And the inability of what was presumably the most sophisticated econometric model that anybody had of the economy, not being a very reliable indicator of where the economy was going was, I think, rather impressive in terms wow. of uh, maintaining a certain skepticism <laughs> and some degree of common sense and, and judgment uh, when you're looking at the economy, whether you're making investments or running monetary policy or whatever. Uh, I, I am of the view, which is not the normal view these days among a lot of people, but William McChesney Martin was uh, head of the central bank for more years than anybody else, and his favorite expression was, this is now 50 years ago, <laughs> it's very important to have economists in the central bank, but keep them on tap, don't put them on top. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Okay, well, I was, I was going to ask you... rather some deviated from that. Uh, well, I was going to ask you some practical, practical pointers about what could be done, and there is one. Um, although, of course, it's very noticeable if you look in my, in my last book, I actually went back and looked at the employment record of people who were being hired by central banks. And really, starting from the 1990s, <coughs> it began to be absolutely dominated by BAs um, and PhDs in economics, and nothing wrong with that, but it was very much a single tribal group that came to the fore. But do you have any other, um, any other thoughts about what can practically be done to try and recognize that models can be useful, but not the, not the only thing that can be a good Well, I, I don't think it's already been said here. I don't think behavioral economics, I like that phrase, because it reflects, I think, reality. <laughs> behavior is something to do with it, and behavior is not so stylized as, as economists uh, have in the past thought. Uh, but how do you take advantage of that in a practical way? I don't think it's been developed as, as Willem said, it's kind of a series of anecdotes in a way. And I decided I would freshen my mind. I knew vaguely what behavioral economists were doing, but I wondered whether there was some theorizing going on here and some model building I wasn't familiar with, and I was going to appear very ignorant in this panel. So he sent me, my grandson, who had taken behavioral economics, sent me a little stuff, called him up, said, big emergency. He said, well, here's the best stuff I can give you in the short run. And what I looked for, and what was said, is by people who were involved in this, that they hadn't been able to develop, and they didn't know whether you should, could develop a kind of model of behavior in the economy that took account of all the vagaries uh, of uh, expectations and understanding or uh, quirks of personality that human beings have that aren't reflected in the economic right. modeling. And I think that's true. I, uh, if we ever had this perfect model, it wouldn't work because then that would affect people's expectations and they'd have to think of a different model that took account of the expectation and like change it and then they have to take account of the expectations of what would happen to those who were thinking about the future expectations. So um, I think we're going to be left with a certain amount of uncertainty. Right. 
Uh, President Zadir, do you have any advice for people who are running emerging market countries about what to do with The Economists? Uh, I no longer give advice. <laughs> 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 well, I have opinions. Uh, <laughs> no, no, let, let me again uh, step back a little bit to the question you made to, to Paul. Uh, and it's about uh, whether or not, you know, this uh, relatively new field, although Bob explained that it goes back to Adam Smith, uh, uh, the theory of moral uh, sentiments, and I, I, I fully agree, you know, how does it uh, apply? And I think it, it's very important. I mean, we may say that it is a collection of anecdotes or of experiments, but I think it's useful first to, to prove that some of the models that uh, have been used uh, in the recent past as if they were, you know, incredible absolute truths, well, uh, can fail and can fail very seriously because uh, they have an inherent uh, uh, construction that probably will make them fail. You know, this uh, ultra-rational uh, man that takes uh, brilliant decisions, you know, as if everybody were a Paul Samuelson or something like that. I mean, it's simply not possible. And there are these uh, biases that you have to take into account if you are trying to figure out what is uh, going on in the world. Uh, but still, uh, you know, a, a good part of the profession wants to to, to think like that, I, I took a, uh, I was reading the speech by Bill Dudley, who is somebody I admire a lot because he's not only a, a good economist, he's a great public servant, uh, but uh, let, uh, he gave a speech last week in China. He says, Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations introduced the concept of the invisible hand. Smith argued that individuals acting in their self-interest can collectively promote the public interest. This concept, I believe, also often applies to international monetary policy. The biggest problems that countries create for others often stem from getting policy wrong domestically. Recession or instability at home is often quickly exported abroad. Equally important growth and instability abroad makes it easier to set policy at home. Well, this is wrong. I mean, and I say this with incredible respect first, because as Bob uh, uh, said, well, you know, uh, the, the, uh, Adam Smith also said other things, uh, but the problem here is that you do need macroeconomic policy coordination at the international level. Otherwise, you can be in deep trouble as we are uh, today. And this is not uh, an irrelevant consideration because by not having uh, that coordination, we are paying a high price. And what is described here is that, well, if countries just care about themselves, we will have a nice uh, equilibrium. Well, I think we are going to have a fishing equilibrium <laughs> in a way, and that takes me to emerging countries. You know, I think emerging countries are suffering and are bound to suffer a lot simply because we are having faulty policies at the international level, and I think this is too bad. Now, uh, perhaps what is missing here, you know, in all this discussion, when I listen to, to Bob Schiller and other behavioral economists, what is really missing is the other part, the macro. We, we speak about uh, all these uh, questions of asset markets, and we speak about the crisis, and today the crisis is still uh, presented as a problem with the bankers, problems in financial markets, and we have forgotten about the previous story. The previous story is poor macroeconomic policies that allow global macroeconomic imbalances to get out of control so that some countries had too many resources with perhaps too few investment opportunities. That was the United States borrowing a lot of money from China and others with a current account deficit of 7% of GDP. So the question is, yes, you have to be washing financial markets, but you have to be washing your macroeconomic uh, policy too. And you have to be watching it nationally, but also you want to live in globalization and with interdependence, you have to accept a significant degree 
of coordination of macro policies. Otherwise, uh, you are going to, to pay a very high price. Even if you have, by the way, very good, very clever financial uh, policies or instruments in which you have, uh, by means of perhaps uh, super artificial intelligence, incorporated everything that Bob Schiller ha is teaching us. If you have poor macro policy, right. then you are in trouble no matter what. Right. Well, that's a very sobering point. Um, Willem, in terms of, I mean, you work in a bank these days. Um, you've seen how bankers behave, how central bankers behave as well. I mean, what do you think this means for financial institutions in practical terms? Well, uh, for you to start with central banks and uh, make them recognize something that was forgotten uh, to varying degrees in most advanced economies, central banks, in the years leading up to the great financial crisis during the so-called, you know, the, whatever, the, the great becoming, uh, that uh, the first responsibility of the central bank is financial stability. Right? Whether you have a dual mandate, a triple mandate, or a single mandate, you know, price stability, uh, prices and maximum employment, that's all secondary. Right? The, the key thing is, is, is financial stability. Um, the lend of last resort in a bank-dominated economy, role of the central bank, is the most important one. In a capital market-dominated economy, there has to be market make of last resort as well, you know, to intervene and make market uh, when market liquidity dries up, uh, 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 act as a buyer of last resort most of the time. Um, um, and uh, I think you really have to ensure to the best of your ability that uh, there are no entities that, uh, uh, that cannot fail without creating a systemic disaster. Right? And uh, if that means uh, breaking up uh, entities uh, between different activities or even within an activity, then, then so be it. Uh, it is, uh, because if you do make things too big to fail, you, you know, moral hazard and very classic economic incentives uh, of the sort of <laughs> not even the behavioral kind of the of the of the you know, of the everywhere kind um, will make sure that uh, you know you have an endemic source of stability of instability there. Um, other lessons: uh, don't once you have no entity too big to fail, right? Uh, literally, they have no need for C cars and stress tests and all these other fighting of the last wars. Right and uh, failing to address the likely next source of uh, uh, of financial instability. Incidentally, on that ground, uh, on that ground, learning does not take place. Right, this is a, a, a fact that has to be remembered. I was shocked out of my mind when a couple of weeks ago I discovered that um, ABS, asset-backed securities, in fact, technically CLOs, backed by subprime residential mortgages, were again being pushed. I thought we would never see these things again, right? These are instruments that should never have existed because it suckers people that cannot really uh, you know, afford to take the exposure of a classical mortgage uh, into uh, assuming liabilities uh, that uh, they, they really can't afford. And it is a, I think it's just a crime against humanity. But yeah, it's back, right? Why? Well, because you know, for political reasons, politicians are pushing uh, to let to get people desperate to climb on the property ladder to give them a foothold there. Um, uh, it, it's tragic. So um, uh, learning does not take place. Um, don't rely on internal risk models, right, but in, in regulation. Right? If it cannot be verified independently, easily, by outsiders, you know, don't rely on it for uh, calculating uh, risk rated sources of capital. Um, uh, central banks should spend as much time looking at macroprudential instruments as at uh, the interest rate. They need both, I think, to manage financial stability. Uh, one of the real problems with the Fed is that it has no macroprudential instruments. Uh, it has one, actually. It is the, um, uh, what is it? Uh, it's a margin requirement for stocks. It hasn't been changed in 40 years, right? So, um, but it doesn't have counter-cyclical capital requirements. It doesn't have counter-cyclical uh, loan to value or loan to income uh, ceilings. It doesn't have uh, counter cyclical leverage ratios, liquidity requirements. Uh, when Mr. Yellen talks about uh, you know, um, <coughs> macroprudential policy, uh, uh, she means across the cycle macroprudential policy. 
not counter cyclical capital ratios, but high capital ratios. And I'm all in favor of that because it makes it less likely that a crisis will happen. And if it happens, the, the impact will be serious. But it is not leaning against the wind. And that's, we need more of that. And so I think these are the obvious lessons, right? Uh, first, get central banks to focus not primarily on price stability and unemployment. That's secondary. These are important as well, but only subject to the goal of financial stability. Because without that, you can neither have price stability nor uh, uh, no macro, uh, nor, uh, no, no full employment. So um, uh, one final thing, uh, um, the, um, there are real cognitive obstacles sometimes to sensible monetary policy. Um, uh, the, the response, for instance, to uh, negative uh, nominal interest rate, negative policy rates, right, uh, cannot be understood, I think, uh, rationally in a conventional <coughs> economic model. Uh, there's a cognitive problem here uh, that, uh, uh, that um, uh, I think one has to live with and, and hopefully educate the masses on. We're going to be in the foreseeable future in a world where the risk-free real rate at long maturities even and the risk-free nominal rate are going to be close to zero, close enough right. to revisit the zero lower bound on a regular basis. Right? So that means it will be extremely desirable to remove the effective lower bound and allow uh, you know, interest rates to be symmetric around, around zeros, easily at minus five is plus five. Um, and um, that's not difficult to do. There are at least three ways of doing it. You know, Gazelle's way, taxing currency, abolishing currency, or having a variable exchange rate between currency and deposits. Right. Right? Uh, and, uh, uh, but the arguments that you, that you get, literally, are that this is an immoral uh, and um, a, a perverse the policy. Right? Right. Uh, negative rates are called, very motively, um, a, um, a tax on savers and on creditors or a, um, a confiscation of the wealth of creditors. And that, by that the same token, of course, positive interest rates are a tax on borrowers and a confiscation of the wealth of borrowers. Um, and at some point you have to move cognitively to a world where minus three is no more usual than plus three percent. Right. And the sooner we get that, the better. Right. Okay, well, I'm going to jump in here because I am conscious that we have a lot of people sitting in the room who have strong views and who have a lot to contribute um, to this discussion. Um, we've heard a lot of ideas about what can be done. They include um, focusing on macroeconomic coordination, keeping economists on tap, not on top. And if you're about to do an epoch-changing event like raise interest rates, very high, don't necessarily believe your economic models. That seemed to be one of the messages from Jim um, Volker. Um, we've got um, from Willem talking about macroprudential regulation at central banks. Um, essentially, that banks need to think about whether they're going to be stable um, in a crisis, um, break up the banks perhaps. And then, of course, look at economic history, look at economic psychology. I would argue try hiring an anthropologist. All of those. <laughs> can be useful. Not that desperate. No, no not that desperate. Okay. Um, all of those can be useful for dealing with the shortcoming of economics, if not models. But I'd like to bring the audience in at this point and see if anybody in the audience has got any suggestions, comments, questions about how to deal with this. I would argue, please, um, I'm, I have to, actually, sorry, I'm not allowed to talk to you as the audience, your members, not the audience. Why um, can't the audience consist of members? I didn't understand that. <laughs> I, mean, I think they've all been promoted to be members. Um, I have to remind you this meeting is on the record. I have to remind you that you have to wait for the microphone and speak directly into it. Um, I would ask you to um, please state your name and affiliation. Um, that's courteous, if not compulsory. And above all else, please limit it to one question and keep it very brief. Otherwise, I will cut you off. <laughs> um, so who would like to ask the first question? Let's start there and then go to the back of the room over there. Thank you. This is Ebrahim Rabari of Citigroup. We heard, we heard about the importance of uh, international policy coordination. We, of course, have Chairman Volker here, uh, and that's been a, a popular topic of late as well. So if I could ask you perhaps to recall the circumstances, uh, both economic and in terms of the political economy, that led to uh, international policy coordination in your time, and what you would think would have to happen for that to exist in the near future again. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess that question is uh, relevant in two times in my experience. Um, let's go back to 1971. 
uh, where the dollar had been under some pressure. Uh, our gold stock was diminishing. The balance of payments after being in surplus for years and years uh, was going into deficit. It had been in trade deficit. Uh, it seemed to me uh, and to others that we were going to have to get an exchange rate <laughs> change. Now, how are you going to get an exchange rate change? Were we going to call together the other major central banks and say, gentlemen, I think we need an exchange rate change. Uh, uh, who wants to volunteer for changing 15%, let's say, make it meaningful? The volunteers were not uh, very evident. But we knew that was going to happen. So we said the only way to change this is, as an interim step, we will unfortunately have to stop the gold price fixation, let the dollar float, and other currencies are going to float too, and presumably, if it all went well, we would move toward a sustainable equilibrium, whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> the fact is, um, there was no great desire to move. And yet, they've been complaining about the dollar for years. We're running a deficit, they're running a surplus. Okay, let's get an exchange rate realignment. And with the partial exception of Germany, which had done some on its own, everything was quiet. Well, we finally had a negotiation. We did agree to a, a change, but uh, before that negotiation, the suggestions from some of our European partners were, all right, we'll change by 2% or 3%. And they were, you know, numbers that seemed totally inadequate to the possibility of any China. change in the equilibrium. Well, we finally negotiated somewhat larger changes than that. Uh, we would say it was 10% and we left out Canada, and since Canada didn't move much, it was less than 10%. But at least to me at the time, it seemed inadequate. Uh, and we did not agree to restore convertibility, which upset everybody, because we didn't think we could sustain it. We went through a prolonged negotiation. We made up the first committee of 20 to have this negotiation. And it was very difficult to get a consensus. And we, we finally did make a further devaluation, but spe that set off speculative processes and it broke down. So there was an agreement that for the time being at least we'll have to float, everybody. I don't think the success of that was very great. It helped set off very large fluctuations in the dollar and other currencies. Big help create a big inflation in the United States. But the theory was that it would settle down in the long run, and not so long run, and floating rates were the way to go. But we ended up with floating rates because it was impossible, maybe the inadequacy of the, uh, the negotiators, to get an agreement on the kind of uh, suggestion that uh, President Sadio was talking about. Now I'll come back to another embarrassing, no, it's not really embarrassing, but now I'm chairman of the Federal Reserve Board instead of the Undersecretary of the Treasury. And we had an inflation problem, big inflation problem, in my judgment. It was affecting psychology, it was affecting the mood of the country, everybody was unhappy, uh, there was no confidence in the restoration of price stability, and we went out at hammer and tongs. That was not a terribly helpful development from the standpoint of many developing countries that have gotten increasingly heavily debt, debt in dollars. And the suggestion was somebody made, didn't you take that into your account? And my answer to that was not much, because there wasn't much I could do to help that situation when they were already getting desperately in debt. And to at that point saying, we will try to gonna coordinate policy in a way that undermined our anti-inflation policy seemed to be counterproductive. You know, again, we didn't do it. Now, there have been incidents here and there, a year or two following that, actually, where there was, in the short run, some accommodation. You saw it in the Plaza Agreement. 
There must say the plan in the Louvre Agreement. And there was a lot of talk about coordinating exchange rate policies. There was a lot in the communique about adjusting economic policies. The part about adjusting exchange rate intervention with a certain purpose had some reality. All those words in the communique about adjusting domestic economic policies were words in the communique that had no influence that I'm aware of on actual policies, because that's pretty tough stuff. Uh, I could repeat right. same kind of story in the loop. But it's just an illustration of the practical difficulties, even in areas where the incentive might have been quite strong, to get that kind of uh, coordination you're talking about. Right. Like, uh, should I shut up? No, no, no. <laughs> No, I was going to go to the next question well, in a second. The other incident I kind of remember is a practical political problem. We talk about behavioral economics, and you need behavioral political systems for this. Uh, <laughs> shortly <laughs> before, 1980, uh, when did I become chairman? 79, 78, they had this great bond conference where there was a feeling the system was falling apart, and the finance ministers all met and agreed upon some exchange rate changes and presumably some policy changes. Helmut Schmidt, who was very outspoken, said that was the most serious mistake Germany ever made because we adopted some economic policies that we didn't think were in our interest as part of an effort to be cooperative. And all it does was mess things up over a period of years, in his view. And I, he may have been right, because the forecast upon which those changes were suggested were not very valid anyway. Right. Uh, but it's a very difficult process. So how do we get realistically an international monetary system that has enough flexibility so it's not going to break down in the short run, but some limitation on the volatility of markets? It's a very difficult thing to do. And we haven't right. succeeded. We obviously haven't well, I think succeeded. it's still a very, very big challenge even today. I mean, probably well, well, now more than bigger than ever before. The only thing we have is uh, what the, uh, the U.S. put in place under Bernanke during the crisis, the swap lines, right? That's the, the hardly coordination. That was a unilateral act of uh, sort of intelligent self-interest, <laughs> right? Yeah, I hope and, so. And uh, um, we should be expanding that, of course, as I would say now, and extend it to key emerging markets. If the IMF won't do it, right, then the U.S. might as well do it. After all, the U.S. has the only reserve currency in the world. Right. We have a question right at the back over there on the, yes. Um, oh. uh, Herbert Levin. Uh, Chairman Volcker, uh, the effect on the American economy and the uh, world economy at present and in the near term of the uh, evolution of the Chinese economy, what effect do you think that has? Well, I think it has a big effect. <laughs> we, we, we can't and avoid... And we have quite a few more questions, so we need to keep the answers quite short. Yeah. Pardon me? We have quite a few more questions, hands waving. But, uh, okay. what, what effect In one minute or two China, minutes. China's economy is someday going to be as big as the American economy. By some measures, it's almost uh, there. And they have the external trade, I guess, is bigger than America's external trade. Yeah. Uh, and we are learning that they can have business fluctuations uh, in their planned economy just as we can in our market economies and they're struggling with a partial market economy. Uh, so to be practical, I think the suggestion can be made, recognizing that the force of the changes in the Chinese economy, recognizing the size of the American economy in particular, maybe not a very politic thing to say, but if you're going to make some progress toward the kind of thing Ernesto is worried about, you've got to get the two biggest, color, <laughs> two biggest economies uh, more or less involved. Uh, if you can't do that, the rest of it isn't going to fall into place. Now, whether the, when and how the time is appropriate for that kind of involvement between China and the United States is interesting. There used to be, if there was some anchor of cooperation in the world 20, 30 years ago, it was between the United States and Germany as the next biggest uh, 
economic policy before the euro, and the hope would be with the euro, but before the euro, and Germany was, I, I expressed some concern that they had earlier, but they were more flexible in terms of the kind of cooperation that's necessary, as we saw it, than most other countries. And I think it helped stabilize things for a while. Right. Yeah. And we've got a question over, over here. Thank you. Uh, Ricky Tigard Helfer, the Gurmeen Foundation US. Uh, President Zidio, how are you? Nice to see you. Uh, the question is, um, there's a lot of emphasis now on inequality, the haves and the have-nots. Some would say the U.S. election currently may in fact be an evidence of that. But what do you think the uh, likely effect of continuing exclusions of large percentages of people in a number of developing and developed economies in the world, what effect could that have on financial stability over time? And what can we do to deal with it? Well, we will have to uh, discuss a little bit uh, the sequence. I think uh, financial, uh, lack of financial stability or insufficient supply of the global public good of uh, international financial stability will make it harder uh, or will postpone the process of economic convergence that we had been observing up to very recently. Uh, the idea was, till three or four years ago, that a large group of developing countries, emerging countries, who were making a lot of progress in conversion. Now that idea is uh, gone because the commodity boom or super cycle is over. Uh, the emperor has no longer clothes, and countries, emer some emerging countries, are discovering that they are deep uh, in trouble. One of them, unfortunately, well, several of them, but given its size, uh, it has to be mentioned, is the case of, uh, of Brazil. And that's a terrible disappointment. And of course, that is going to have uh, political consequences uh, in countries that uh, the population gets uh, frustrated in the sense that they had some expectations that are not being uh, fulfilled. Uh, and this, of course, gives rise to explanations to, that are wrong, to populist uh, postures. And we Latin Americans invented populism in a way, <laughs> unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a, that's a big uh, issue. Uh, so uh, again, uh, I think there is a, a great need of recognizing that this is a common problem and that somehow uh, we need to have, and I, I would insist on that, on uh, coordinating policies to, if not going back to the very high rates of growth that we had before the crisis, and in some cases right after the crisis, in the case of some emerging countries, we need higher growth in the world. And we are not going to have it uh, with the way in which we are doing things, in which uh, we are basically in a prisoner's uh, dilemma. I don't know how sustainable this situation is. I don't know, uh, let's say the United States continues to do so-so or well. Uh, is that sustainable while other countries are not doing so well? I think eventually there will be some disequilibria here that will stop the process. Is it sustainable for Germany to have a current account surplus of 7% of GDP uh, and other northern European countries? Is that going to be sustainable for the European Monetary Union? Absolutely not. So this is a mess. So the examples that were used by Chairman Volcker, well, it was a little bit like, a, like a, the Greens, Greenspan pot. You know, say, okay, if there is a bubble, <laughs> let it break and then we'll go and fix it. Well, in 71, you were fixing a mess that had been built uh, in the previous 10 years. Uh, when you did the Plaza Accord, again, you know, it was almost a desperate situation. I'm talking about something fundamentally different. I'm talking about, you know, in 2006, when we knew that there were these significant disequilibria, well, that uh, the IMF tried to do an exercise 
to do proper surveillance and push countries to adjust in the right direction. Uh, there was a proposal and they put it in the, in the drawer. When the crisis exploded uh, a couple of years later, well, in 08, they created the G20. First paragraph of the declaration, we are here because we have had uncoordinated, incoherent uh, policies. So now we promise that we will have a mechanism to coordinate policies and you reconstruct the history of the G20 and it's the most, one of the most disappointing right. exercises. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we cannot have it both ways. We want to enjoy the fruits of interdependence, but we are not willing to pay a price for interdependence. And that is to say, to agree on some, uh, at least some directions in, in policies. Right. So that's my point. If we don't do that, then your inequality problem will be, and that's also my problem, right. and everybody's problem will get worse. We've got hardly, May I make oh, well, take one, one last question quickly, but yes. <laughs> I want to make a brief commentary on this, because I think the Euro, Eurozone is an interesting case, but Germany is out of equilibrium with the rest, quite clearly. There are all kinds of political uh, reasons why they want to hold the Euro together and hold uh, uh, the European Union together. It's being tested. it would be interesting to see how this test comes out. To hold it together, that disequilibrium within the economic disequilibrium within the Euro has to be taken care of. If it's not, it will disintegrate. Yeah. Which is more likely? Well, <laughs> uh, as a practical in, in, matter, in where you, seconds, like where you get even time. with that pressure for coordination. Well, then we will go to disintegration, hmm? and that will be the beginning of what? Because if the monetary union breaks down, I don't know what will happen with the common market, and if the common market breaks down, then I don't know what comes next, and here we go back to 1914. Go back, to, go back to the era of, <laughs> of politics, <laughs> not economics. Uh -huh. Professor Desai, see you. Mm. Trying to be the last question, because we're almost out of time. A question for Dr. Paul Volker. Do you think that um, policy making in the US, uh, especially during the current years of the recession, uh, has been entirely dependent on monetary policy because fiscal policy? and budgetary issues well, have been caught up in Congress as a result of contentious party politics. Well, it's obviously been heavily dependent upon monetary policy in recent years. There was more or less effective fiscal policy in the midst of the crisis. So we did have a big, big budgetary uh, uh, action. God, we had deficits that I never would have imagined. What it was close to what, 40 or 50 percent of the budget was in deficit, 15% of the, four, over 10% of GDP. I don't remember what it was. But after that, and we had the initial recovery, and obviously, yes, it's been left with a roadblock in Washington about any kind of sensible policies of, about anything. That fiscal policy has been frozen. And so monetary policy had to carry pretty much the full load of being. It's a dangerous situation because people have looked at monetary policy to create some miracles that isn't within the capacity of monetary policy, in my view, to, to create. There are limitations probably at the rate of speed of the growth of the American economy, not very different from what's actually happening. And to expect uh, uh, the central bank to have something in their hat that's suddenly going to, suddenly going to change the growth rate, I think is mistaken. Right. Well, sadly, I mean, I think we could have another hour talking about this. Sadly, we are indeed out of time. It's been fascinating. I mean, my main conclusions are, one, everyone agrees to agree that economic models alone are not a great guide. Everyone agrees that they have lots of great stories about how economic models are a, not a great guide. But trying to find a practical solution to what to do about a world where economic models don't always work remains incredibly hard. Um, but thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts. It's been very challenging. And I think we're now going to ha hand over to Michael Levy, who is going to close the, um, today's event. <laughs>